Hi, and welcome to Kidney Plugged In. BC Kidney Days is an annual conference which brings together clinicians, administrators, and patient partners from across BC, other parts of Canada, and the US to discuss the latest research trends, clinical treatments, and surgical breakthroughs in kidney patient care. This year, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, for the very first time, BC Kidney Days went virtual. And on this episode of Plugged In, we bring you some highlights from the 2020 BC Kidney Days Conference. Better Together, a patient-centered approach to kidney care. So stay with us because these highlights and more are coming up next, right here on Kidney Plugged In. So welcome to this concurrent session entitled Virtual Care, Kidney Care in 2020 and Beyond. My name is Anurag Singh. I'm a nephrologist in Prince George, medical director of Northern Health's Kidney Care Services and co-chair for this year's BC Kidney Days. COVID-19 crisis has forced us to adapt quickly and learn new ways to connect with people that we care. As kidney care professionals, we look after individuals who are vulnerable yet need regular clinical care. Our speaker today has been at the center of developing, spreading, and standardizing virtual care through our kidney clinics in BC. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Mike Pagalacqua, who is a nephrologist in Fraser Health with additional training in health administration. Mike also serves as a chair of the Provincial Kidney Care Committee and leads the BC PKD network. Mike, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Anurag. Thanks for that, that introduction. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking a little bit more about virtual care, where it is now and where we see it going uh, in the future of renal care. So let's just launch into it. Um, and again, I think we really need to remember to set the stage. Uh, I like this phrase that's been coming out now. People are calling it the before time, before COVID, which is from Mad Max, if, you, if you're an old film buff. Um, and I think it's a little bit appropriate, you know, dealing with what we've had to in the last year or so. But I, it is important, I think, to remember where we've come from in terms of renal care. And all of our renal care for many years has very much been team-based. It's a multidisciplinary team is a very, very unique thing. It's not just a collection of different people. It's a group of different professionals all united in the same goal of, of uh, enhancing our patient care. And so I have people listed here and I'm sure I'm missing some that, that are involved in the renal team, but it's a large number of people. And more importantly, it's integrated. It's not different providers all providing care in parallel to each other or independent of each other. It's a team together offering an integrated uh, bundle of care. And, and that might seem like I'm splitting hairs, but it really is a, a, an important difference that's gonna come up as we talk about how we support that in, in the virtual world. And in addition to our team being kind of a, a complex and uh, integrated group, the care we offer to, to renal patients is, is somewhat complex as well. So renal care is, in, is unique in that it's longitudinal care. In many of our patients, it's over many years or even decades, um, but it's interspersed with different events and different trajectories. I kind of like to break up what we offer in our kidney clinics into these buckets of, of services. So we have, we have some tasks that are more education oriented, either to talk about self-management, things like blood pressure, diabetes, you know, et cetera, or when we're talking about more complex things like renal treatment modalities. So we have our education uh, components. We have at times where we go into what I call autopilot mode or, or surveillance, where we're kind of just keeping an eye on things, seeing where a patient is at and then keeping them stable. So that's both in our clinic and between clinic visits. Uh, and then at, through, at certain times, we'll have our navigation components too. So the most obvious one there being transition to different care modalities. But, you know, there are other things they have to access. They have to go see different specialists. They have to get treatments done. So there's a whole bunch of parts where they have to find their way. So that's why I like this picture of peaks and valleys, because that's really what our renal care is over the course of someone's uh, lifetime. It's not one steady or constant level of services we're providing, but it goes up and down in these, in these uh, ways. And then we had to change everything. And it's important, I think, to recognize that this is not something that we decided to do. That sounds obvious, you know, when I say it out, out loud, but, but the reason I'm making that point is that if this was a planned body of work, we would have had a strategy, we would have had an evaluation plan, we would have made you know precise changes and then decided and then documented what happened afterwards. Whereas that's not at all what happened here. We were dealt something we just had to, to change rapidly. Sometimes it is worthwhile to reflect just how much 
has changed or how different this is compared to where we were just six to, to nine months ago. So there's the whole uh, aspect of having ch changes in configurations of our, our clinics, uh, reduced access to, to providers. Uh, that one I think is key that we're recognizing more and more. There's both real reduced access and perceived reduced access. There's reduced access to our kidney team and some patients are struggling with reduced access to their primary care providers. And the combination thereof can be quite a, quite a difficult one to manage. And there's a whole host of human factors. And I wanna list that one because I think we all think about the ways that our formats and our clinics have changed, but there's also the impact it's had on people. Our patients are a very heterogeneous group of, of, of people. They all come from different backgrounds. And because of this, they have different ways and different comforts in accessing our new methods of care. Um, our team members themselves also have different levels of comfort and different level of ability to, to adapt to these. And even nine months out, everybody's still, I think, a little bit anxious and uncertain. And, and it's important to recognize that because that does play into to, to what we're expecting of people. How do we bring that previous philosophy of multidisciplinary renal care that we've had for so many years to served us so well, how do we bring this into the virtual setting? I think this is, this is the item that we really want to talk about here. And we've always had this concept in the past when we're talking about treatment modalities of finding the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And so here the mantra that I'm going to when we're talking about virtual health is that now we have to also think about how do we find the right visit type for the right patient at the right time. And this is a decision that we're gonna to have to make over and over and over again, essentially every time we're interacting with the patient. So let's split this up a little bit. So for visit types, we now have actually a buffet of options available to us. It doesn't sound like much, but there is actually quite a few formats when you start breaking this apart. So of course we have in-person visits, which have been something that's served us uh, uh, for quite a long time. Although our in-person visits now do look different than what they looked like before. But even our virtual visits, it's worth remembering that there's several different ways this can happen. So phone is a type of virtual visit. The patient's not with you, so you can be doing it by phone. We have our traditional telehealth setup, what we call facility-based video conference, where the patient actually physically goes to a facility, goes to a special room that has the hookup and does their video conferencing visit. There may or may not be a, a care provider there as well. Or they can do video conferencing from their own home. And the reason that I'm saying there's actually a buffet of options is that actually, when you think about it, there can be any permutation of those things. Because in a lot of settings, different staff are seeing patients in different ways. So it might be that I decide that I'm gonna bring them in to see the patient physically as the physician, and maybe the nurse will see them physically as well, but the dietitian is still calling them by phone. Maybe the social worker has a video call with them. And so that's, that's why I have this little picture of permutations on the side, is that it can really be any combination of those things that's contributing to what we would previously have called one clinic visit. We have really need to, I think, be quite honest about this. There's good, there's bad, and there's ugly. And I think we need to have a frank conversation around this. The good, and I really, really want to emphasize this, is that it's almost unheard of the amount of change we've made in a few weeks, in a few months to keep people safe. And I really want to you know, congratulate everyone on that. This is completely unprecedented, and everyone's done a stellar job to make sure the patients can still be cared for. But there are some other advantages with virtual care. They can be faster, some of these virtual visits. They can be more convenient. And one of the things we've learned is it can facilitate some supplements to in-clinic care, like webinars, you know, things that people can attend uh, without having to come in. And there are webinars that are better attended than they ever have been. So those are all positive things. But there is some bad, and I think some people have realized this. The main one that I see is that the novelty's worn off and people are sick of phone calls both patients and, and staff are sick of talking to people on the phone or by video. One of the advantages of the virtual care is that it can be quite fast or efficient, but the downside is that you might lose all of that efficiency spending uh, time doing IT support or what I call air traffic control, making sure the right person is talking to the right provider. We've already talked about the, the difficulty forming relationships and part of it actually that I worry about the most is that some patients just can't engage to the same degree. And it's not a fault of their own, but some people are just able to talk on the phone and, and have a good visit. Other people just can't. And I think we've all recognized that. And then there is of course the ugly. Um, you know, we know that in many situations, virtual visits are just not good enough. We're still awaiting evaluation to tell us this for sure, but we know it's not a replacement. And so in a lot of cases, the type of visit we're having is not the type of visit we want. And, and that's a bad feeling as a care provider. 
I, I think it's important to remember where we came from and to think about how we're going to, to bring this into the future and do this in a, a, an objective type of a way. I'm Dan, and this is Art, and we're from Moose Meat and Marmalade, and our plan today is to cook some wonderful healthy food that's really great for people that need to cut out sodium, or at least reduce sodium from their diet. We're going to show you some tips, some techniques, and you're going to end up with a delicious meal. This is all about fresh, delicious, vibrant, healthy food. What are we going to make? Something with flavor, I hope. We want to, we want to add a lot of flavor because renal Diet excludes salt and sodium, right? How about if we can make it energy efficient so you use one pot to do two parts of the meal? That's how I cook all the time, man. Should we get cracking? <laughs> Let's do it. So, What's your plan? You've got, you've well, got I've a got, menu, right? I've got a, I've got a plan and I thought we would do a potato salad, crushed potatoes with herbs, um, a salad of asparagus and arugula and zucchini, and then some roasted salmon with salsa verde. Give me something to well, do. Well, why don't you cook, cook the potatoes? My understanding is we want to try and remove some potassium. Boil them twice and throw away the water, and you remove more potassium. If you cut them up rather than cooking them whole, you also remove potassium. And we're, of course, not going to put salt in the water. Are, are we allowed to use butter, saltless butter? Salt yes, butter. we have butter. Butter's fine. Now salmon, this is lovely salmon. This is spring salmon, often known as king salmon, or the correct term is Chinook salmon. So we're gonna pan roast the salmon. Pan roasting, a technique we see on menus in restaurants. We're probably trying to avoid restaurants to cut down on sodium. Skin on, skin off. Skin, skin off. off. I'm not, can you believe it? Gonna put any salt on here. Okay, so lay the fish in and Lay it in, and then the key thing is leave it alone. Don't touch it, don't prod it, don't poke it. Just leave it. I think, right, it's, right. I think what we've achieved is perfection. Well, what we're going to do is take some time. Look at this. Love it, I love that. Yeah, I love, I so love we're going to take this time, put it all over the top like that, take the whole thing, and pop it in the oven. And now I thought we'd make salsa verde. Salsa verde, green sauce. Green sauce. Indeed, it is green sauce. And we are using capers. Normally, we'd use anchovy as well. Anchovy is very salty. Capers can be very salty. But we have to remember that we're not going to use much on this dish. So we're using no salt whatsoever in the entire dish. And the only little bit of salt will come from the capers, but we'll use a very small amount on each fish. So in actual fact, this is incredible incredibly low sodium. All right, what are we going to do with the capers? Well, I've got a trick up my sleeve. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to remove some additional sodium from the capers, I'm going to do this. I'm going to squeeze some of that brine out and I'm going to give them a rinse. And now we've reduced the sodium even more so. <laughs> Pop that in there. Good. <laughs> Okay, what do you want in there? Garlic. I want how some... How many cloves? How many do you want? Three, two. two. Mustard. Go One for it. One tablespoon? Why not? Oh. Mint and parsley. Put some, put some in like that. All right. You do some mint. Get some mint, Get some mint in there. A bit more mint? So you want uh, any liquid in there? Yes. I think we want a mixture of olive oil and canola oil. So some canola yeah. oil and some olive oil like right. that. And nothing wrong with a splash of water. All right. We all know it's healthy to have some water in our diet. Very good. Now. So you want me to go ahead and blend? All the way in there, in and out, in and out. You're doing very well. It's looking like a, a sauce. There we go, good enough. You are allowed to use a certain salt substitute, like dash or something, some, once in a while? Arguably, there are things you can use. As but long as they don't contain sodium. As long as they don't contain sodium. And this, even though there's mustard and capers, we're using a very, very small amount on the entire dish. Right. So let's move so on. Just set this aside. Set that aside. Oh, look at that smoke. How's that salmon doing? We're going to pull our salmon yeah. out now. So temperature, 400 degrees. Now don't you forget that handle is hot. So we're not going to cook the top side in this case. Nope, You're we're just, just going to leave it. it. Yeah. Leave it. 
Just leave it like that, and that will, that will just finish cooking all the way through. Now, piece of butter, because we are allowed butter. Okay. Take some butter, and just put a bit of butter over each salmon. Unsalted butter. Okay. So we'll leave, we'll leave that. Should we get onto our salad, do you think? Yeah, let's do that, man. Here's my idea. We've got water boiling there. <laughs> Why not cook our asparagus straight there in that go. water? There we go. All Good right. enough. Good enough. We're going to peel some zucchini, and I think using a peeler is a very easy, safe way to get lovely strips of zucchini like this. Can you find some arugula there, please? How much arugula do you want? Well, One some. One handful. Maybe a bit more. Two handfuls. So there's our arugula. See our asparagus? Our asparagus is cooked, and I have a little trick. Just get your asparagus, put it in a bowl, and run some cold water over it. So, salad ready to go. This is the key thing. It's How not do we bring what it to life? For. Nope, that's going on the salmon. Oh. Lemon juice, lemon zest, and olive oil. All right, while you're doing that, I'm going to check these. I'm so, you start off. crushing those up with some butter and any herbs you like parsley, mint, I get to arugula. I get to strain this, right? Yeah. And there's more herbs in the fridge if you want them. And you said add anything. Well, I mean, within reason. I think some nice, <laughs> <laughs> I think some nice herbs. Um, I've got basil. Would you like some basil? Yeah, basil would be good. How's that? All for right, you? perfect. There you go. So, lemon zest. The trick with lemon zest is this: when you're rubbing the lemon, don't rub it for too long in one place. You don't want to get the white stuff in Correct, there. the pith. The pith. Go like this, just get the zest off, lovely. And now lots of juice. Lemon juice. Now some olive oil, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to rough these up. You don't want the mass, just roughed. Roughed. Do you want a little dry dill? Yeah, let's put a little bit of that in, all right. I need a tiny bit of olive oil. Okay. Okay? Not yep. much, because I didn't go crazy on the butter, but I don't want dry potatoes. When we're used to cooking with salt, and I know many of you are used to cooking with salt, and then you're told you have to go on to a low-sodium diet, taste the food. This is flat. So I'm going to go with more lemon juice and a little more olive oil. You can always bring food to life, but you have to taste it to know it needs something. And in this case, it needed more lemon. Watch this. We're going to slip underneath there. Oh, you see? That is what you're looking for. That's what you get in restaurants, and so often people find hard to recreate at home. But that is pan-roasted fish. And the color, the taste, everything is fabulous. We successfully cooked a lovely salad, fresh and light and zingy. We pan-roasted salmon, we made salsa verde, we did sort of something to some potatoes over here, and it's all come together as a low-sodium, healthy meal that anyone can make at home, not particularly expensive to recreate, and will last a few days, and you can eat from one big platter. Thank you, everybody. Everybody. My name is Tamara. Welcome to BC Kidney Days, and I'm so happy to bring you the exercise break today. Here we go. going to do a bhangra. It's very easy. Just follow me. And we'll start with those same fingers, but here.
Thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Thomas, and I'll be your moderator for this concurrent session. One of my roles at BC Renal is to support the Provincial Palliative Care Committee. Our group felt it was very timely and imperative to discuss moral distress as a topic at BC Kidney Days, knowing that the current pandemic has created unprecedented challenges for our renal healthcare professionals. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Bashir Jawani, who will be addressing resiliency and moral distress and how we can keep it together in, when the pandemic pulls us apart. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. And uh, I'm delighted to uh, get to be with you all today and spend a few minutes talking about this uh, really important uh, topic. But I'd like to start by exploring the idea of stories and, uh, and how we experience uh, the world. So the question I have for you is, how do you experience the world? We tend to think of ourselves, and we are reasoning creatures, thinking creatures. Uh, and sometimes we get preoccupied with what's going on in our minds. But I actually want to suggest uh, that we, we first experience the world viscerally, in a bodily kind of way. And it's only after that that we start to make meaning of our, our, our experiences and clothe them in words. We start to tell stories about what our lives uh, are, what's happening in our lives. Um, and, and a way I found useful to kind of illustrate this is to think about, well, painful experiences, frankly. <laughs> think about the last time you went to the doctor because you were really hurting. Uh, and so the story that comes to my mind is when I had a really bad stomachache. And I'm blessed because uh, my wife is a family physician, and so the doctor I went to was her. And I was hurting, and she wanted to help. And so uh, I was, you know, curled up and um, but had my hand on my stomach, and I was, oh, this is awful. And so she wanted to help, so she came and asked me questions. She said, tell me, where is the pain? Uh, and how bad is it? Scale of zero to ten, is it a, is it a five? What's the, what number would you give it? And how would you describe it? Is it acute pain? Is it like a dull ache? What kind of pain is it? And she's asking me, she's talking to me, she's giving me all these, throwing these words at me, and I, I'm just experiencing pain. And I'm like, I don't know, just, can't you just do something? Uh, and so then I realized, of course, that, well, no, in order for me to get better, I need her help. So I need to answer her questions so she can actually help me deal with this experience, this painful experience I'm having. So I start, I say, okay, well, the pain's here and here. No, it's over here. Yeah, no, I think it's only a five. Oh, no, it's definitely an eight. Uh, and I don't, I, it kind of feels like, I don't know, it's sharp. It's, I don't, and I'm starting now to put words to this experience I'm having. Uh, of of discomfort as it happens. And so this illustrates, I hope, the fact that, you know, we're, we, be, we start to rationalize the experience after we ex uh, actually go through the experience. So what I'm proposing is that uh, we are all composing the story, the written or our, uh, the in language story of our lives after the process of actually going through those lives. And if you accept what I'm saying, well, there's some interesting things that are worthwhile observing. First, we don't always know what our stories are. I'm feeling this stuff, but I don't yet know what the words are I want to add, attach, use to describe that experience. I don't always get it right. I start by saying one thing and then I say, no, 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 the meaning of the words I'm using to describe the experience don't seem to actually capture the essence of that experience. I need to change those words. My story is actually changing over time. Others have influence on our stories, particularly when we're young. When I was young, I was told, this is what a good boy does. This is what life is all, all about. And I started to, and this is, you know, I started to shape the meaning of my life in words based on what others told me was happening to me. Uh, and then slowly as I got older, uh, I was able to start to own, to define for myself uh, what what my experiences actually meant for me. But they're still shaped, influenced by other people. When I go to the doctor and the doctor tells me that this is what's going on for you, he's actually or she's actually helping me to make meaning of my story, but the way, the way she or he frames it is actually going to guide the way I, own, I understand it myself. And I may choose, I may decide that that's actually the wrong understanding, that that's actually not the meaning that's going on in my life. 
One of the most important things about our stories is the power they contain to shape who we become, to influence the choices that we make. You might be wondering about these pictures on the screen. They remind me of a story, a funny story that I've become more fond of lately. It's about this koala bear who's in a forest and diligently climbs up this tree, goes to the highest branch, puts his arms out and jumps off and splat lands tragically on the forest floor. But jumps back up, climbs that tree again, goes to the branch, jumps off again, splat falls again and continues to repeat this cycle. It's heartbreaking to watch. These two birds are watching this with love and pain. And they're saying, one of them says to the other, honey, you know, we really need to tell him he's adopted. Because <laughs> um, obviously the koala thinks he's a bird. And so, uh, and so of course I'm anthropomorphizing here, uh, but the story is meant to point out that what we understand ourselves to be can guide uh, what we actually do in our lives. So, uh, so the stories we tell about our lives, uh, uh, psychologists will tell us, are really important uh, to our sense of well-being, our happiness, our ability to cope with suffering. They kind of bring a, uh, they're, they're the way that we bring kind of a, a unity and integration to our experiences and how different experiences connect one to the other and how who we are is kind of Integrate, integrated, knitted together through the various experiences that we, we have. They help us with suffering because they help us understand why, why certain experiences are worthwhile going through and why others are not and we should actually not do it. I know that I need to work hard every day because the pain that comes from working hard, working hard is not easy, it's working hard, uh, but it's important because it gives us something. Uh, and that makes that working hard a worthwhile thing, an activity to participate in. Uh, so, so it helps us to deal with uh, suffering. At the beginning of COVID, I really appreciated the education and reassurance. And I absolutely loved the webinars. A silver lining for me is just um, the technology. There's so much information there that is easily accessible. I feel more in control of my healthcare because I have more information and want to say thank you so much again for all the reassurance and and the support. I'm a kidney recipient. Um, I had my transplant in 2018. Uh, I'm also a disabled person on full time on a wheelchair. On the onset of this pandemic, uh, I didn't have to be so stressed to get up in the morning anymore just to prepare because it takes me about two and a half hours to get myself ready being a wheelchair user. Uh, I didn't. I don't have to wait <laughs> wait too long for my handy darts to come in and all to take me home. So those are the instances where a lot of things has changed. I save time from all the ways that I have to do. I have lesser stress, including my caregivers and my family. Now I have a lot more time as well to educate myself. To, to understand better my, my condition. One positive experience that I've had during the COVID pandemic era um, has been that kidney care clinics have continued even though we don't see each other in person. So um, for mine, we did it by phone. So I had my blood work done, got the results, and then I talked to the nurse. We went over my blood work and um, I took my blood pressure at home and we talked about that. And then I talked to the social worker on the phone. I talked to the dietitian on the phone. And then my nephrologist called me on the same day. So um, it was a good experience because it felt like just like regular kidney care clinic, only it wasn't in person. The positive aspect I have experienced in the opportunity to pedal a sta modified stationary bike while having my hemodialysis treatment. We keep track of the kilometers and the time that we've ridden. We've ridden across Canada 
I feel it really helps to take your mind off of what is happening, the, the feeling of um, being down or being scared or worried. It's just uh, a good time to not think of anything except pedaling a bike, thinking about where you are. Um, nurses up here have always been a scarce resource. And with uh, the COVID popping up, uh, we were having nurses being taken out of the rotation, which was resulting in uh, a lesser quality of treatment for my dialysis. And it was suggested to me by one of my nurses that uh, there was this program, the home hemodialysis available for those that were interested in it. So after a couple of phone calls, and uh, a couple of visits from Susan, my nurse coordinator, who was an amazing lady. Uh, we came up with a plan for me to head down to Prince George for uh, a three week course that um, I felt uh, quite comfortable in taking. And Susan walked me through the whole process, made me feel confident about doing this process. And it's um, where we are now. For me, that is a fairly positive outcome of this COVID-19 was the opportunity to be able to be at home. I'm delighted to introduce Theresa Atkinson. Theresa is a patient partner at BC Renal, CanSol, Patient Voices Network, and the current president of the Kidney Foundation of BC and Yukon branch. She's also a volunteer with the BC Transplant. In a 36-year journey as a kidney patient, Teresa has experienced life on all forms of renal replacement therapies, including peritoneal dialysis, two failed transplant, followed by hemodialysis, first at an in-center unit and then nocturnal home hemodialysis. After 17 years of waiting, five years ago, she finally received a third, what she calls a miracle kidney transplant. Teresa is passionate about improving the lives of kidney patients and sharing her story hoping to set an example for others living with kidney disease. Thank you. So I'd like to share my personal and community reflections as a long-term patient and of course as president. So I found the virtual health appointments became really helpful and efficient. I was able to speak with my doctors from the comfort of my home and save time and travel even if I wasn't feeling well and limiting my exposure to germs. If I had to go in for a visit, there were less people in the waiting rooms and everyone had been pre-screened. My medication renewals became more streamlined and no longer required in-person doctor visits to refill. Personally, after 30 years of sorting my own medication, which is quite a lot as a kidney patient, I decided to switch to blister packs and saved myself a couple of hours a month. I really like them. My monthly blood work routine became safer with the pre-screening, social distancing, and cleaning routines implemented after every patient visit. I started shopping online and planning meals for an entire week. I also order curbside pickup, saving time and exposure to germs, and personally wipe everything down before it enters my house. I believe I'll probably continue with online grocery shopping at least because I find it saving me money and time because of planning and the lack of temptation to impulse buy, excuse me, and ability to add or delete before I press purchase. I signed up and took in a virtual online accounting course just to brush things up. I found ways to exercise and made it a priority by joining a scheduled exercise in the park this summer. This is probably the hardest part for me, the isolation and not being able to visit and hug my family and friends. I'm lucky because I have a spouse at home. I can't imagine living at single at, during this time. I thank goodness for the technology and being able to have virtual visits. I even have gotten comfortable to meet a couple of friends with home pack lunches in the park where we can social distance. With everyone forced to learn this virtual video technology, I found so many opportunities to volunteer or participate as a patient partner from the comfort and isolation of my home. Without the travel, this has allowed me to participate in many more activities. And probably the biggest significant change for me personally has been allowing myself time for self-reflection. 
thinking about what's really important to me has resulted in better planning, scheduling, and an overall more balanced life. All right, here we go.